so welcome to day two. Uh, there's new things that I've added to, to the bootcamp uh, document that we're using. Um, 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 including like a solution to the exploring, exploring quality metrics exercise. Um, and so, yeah, you basically have two options. You can either like download um, 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 everything again using like um, Gizis and use course. Um, so that's what I'll do myself. Um, 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 or um, most of what changed is um, um, this particular file, the, the bootcamp file. So either um, I added the link um, to the latest version of this R markdown document. I added it at the very top. Or if you go, for example, to, oops, not that menu. Um, to day two, for example, at the very top of day two, you can also find that link. So whichever way you want um, uh, to, to do this, you'll get the latest, um, you can get the latest code. Um, all right, so let's, um, you know, if you could download that code, that'd be great. Uh, I'm gonna go over the, the solution for the interactive graphs from yesterday. Um, so yesterday we had a we had this code over here that was just like a little bit of a placeholder for loading some packages and and getting the same type of object pv underscore df that we had on the um, um, on the code from our from the libd r stats club session um, and so I left over here the comments that were the headings for the different sections that I wanted you to. Uh, to use from that code. And so the, ver the first step for the solution uh, was to use, you know, that this template over here and then copy pasting to it the different pieces of code uh, that, uh, that corresponded to the comments. So let me just open this in a new window so we can see the code from the R club session. Um, I'll make it bigger. Um, right, so like uh, here have uh, a, let me make this to the side. Okay, right, so we have a comment here about like we need a key variable that is unique. All right, so uh, we can find that same comment over here on the right side. And so these were the lines of code that we needed, right? Um, and so the, the, the comments here on the left, right, really highlight the logical steps of what we're going to do, you know, to make our um, interactive graph. Um, um, so that first solution here is that first step in the solution looks like this, right? So we we identify the different comments that are common, and then we start copy pasting the original code that we have on the from the R Club session. And so this code itself won't run for us in our computer. Um, you won't run because it, like there's some objects that or names that have changed. Um, but at least now we have uh, like a like a starting uh, point for us to to modify, right? Um, and that's because like some of the code before here doesn't apply to us. Um, some of the, this code uh, on the our club session does not apply to our uh, current situation. Um, um, and, um, cool. So once you do that though, you have to start editing it. Um, and so that's basically the next step. And like, if you do this interactively, you'll, you'll probably get like a lot of like error messages, um, while we figure out what's different. So let me, I have my solution here on the left side and let's compare that to the original code. Um, so we need the comment, let's make, um, we need a key variable that is unique. Initially, 
on the we were using the R num variable on the right side. On the left side now though, um, we replace that R num by sample ID because that is the variable that gives us a unique um, key for our data set because we have 40 unique entries and we have actually uh, 40 samples total. Um, so these two numbers match. So that means that is, it is completely unique and we can use it. Um, so because that changed, right, we're using a uh, sample ID instead of Arnum, then the comment that says, let's make the key, that piece of code changes a little bit from Arnum on the right side to the sample ID on the left side. Uh, then uh, line 53 here on the, on the right side, that is exactly the same one we'll use because that hasn't changed. Um, then the next line of code, the next uh, set, set of lines, they change uh, quite a bit. And so they change quite a bit because we're gonna remove, uh, oh, I made some typos here, this was removed instead of remote it. We removed mean on the score from the object names. And so uh, on the right side here, we have like gg mean on the score mito versus mean gene. And so on the left side, we don't have that because the variable names are different. Um, so on the right side, we have mean mitochondrial mapping rate. On the left side, we just have the mitochondrial mapping rate directly. Um, the other change uh, is that on the right side, we were using region as a um, brain region variable. On the left side, it's called brain, uh, brain region. Um, so that's the difference there. Um, um, cool. Um, so uh, those are the main differences, removing the mean on the score and changing region to brain region. Uh, for the second plot, we don't actually have ring in our in this example data set. So I chose a different variable. You could have chosen like, um, you know, there was many op there are many options here. Um, and so instead of plotting mean uh, ring, sorry, I'm gonna plot the R RNA rate. Um, 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 on the, from the right to the left. Um, and so that, you know, is also, I'm also removing the mean underscore MITRE rate from the names. So once we have that, then like I still do the convert them to interactive graphs step. So it's the same type of code where I'm using the ggplotly function. Um, the object names are look are, are a little bit different, right? Because they don't have the mean underscore section and I'm plotting uh, mitochondrial mapping rate against our RNA mapping rate instead of RIN in this example. Um, so you notice that um, uh, both plots here have the same like x-axis mitochondrial mapping rate, right? And that was also the case on the, on the um, R club session. Um, uh, and that, because they, they're sharing um, the x-axis, then uh, when I when we combine them together using the subplot function, we can specify that they have a shared x-axis. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, like, um, I actually didn't have this comment about explore order highlight options because, like, we just directly know that we want to make the fancy version of it. Right, this fancy one, and so uh, that is actually basically this you know the same code again uh, that we had initially on the left side, and so what is the end result here? Um, this fancy plot that we have, um, and so this is our intergra interactive graphic at the end. Um, such that, for example, I can left click on this outlier over here, and it's gonna highlight where that point is on the left side, on the left panel. Um, um, so, um, like this plot over the right side is the one that shows the R RNA mapping rate. So it has a pretty high R RNA mapping rate compared to the to the rest of the samples. Uh, but like, um, um, uh, and it's kind of low on the total assigned gene uh, um, variable here, 
um, is the second lowest variable on the left side of the plot. So that's potentially like a sample we might want to exclude um, uh, from our analysis. Um, I'm also going to control click. I'm going to, sorry, I'm change the highlighting color to blue. I'm going to, uh, sorry, let's, let's use purple. I'm going to left click over here. And so now that shows in purple this point, um, which um, um, still has, is the second highest sample in terms of our RNA mapping rate. Um, but like in terms of total assigned gene, it's like um, um, similar to the rest of the, a lot more similar to the rest of the sample. So potentially we wouldn't exclude that sample. Um, and so these type of interactive graphics are quite useful for exploring the data and uh, determining uh, uh, if we have any problematic samples. Right. Um, are there any questions about this? Oh, all right. <clears throat> so let's move on to date number two. Um, so, um, so the first thing we wanted to do on, on today is to explore gene expression. Um, and so there's, uh, several ways of doing this. Um, but, um, uh, one way to do it is to use the dimension reduction technique. Um, because we have like, um, you know, thousands of genes. So it's hard to see like the like expression measurements for all those thousands of genes at a time. And so we use a dimension reduction technique. We can compress that information um, into something that we can actually see. Um, and so um, there's two techniques for that um, that are commonly used quite a bit. One of them is uh, principal component analysis or PCA. And the other one is multi-dimensional scaling or MDS. Uh, um, so uh, I don't know where, the where that comment is showing. Um, it's a footnote in theory. Um, um, so I left a little footnote there if you wanted to find like more details on that cross-validated thread, like it shows a lot of math and um, details that uh, uh, some of you um, might be interested in. Um, um, I was reminded this week that one of you actually has a bachelor's in math, <laughs> which I didn't remember. <laughs> so I was like, oh, cool. You might want to you know, check that out for example. Um, so this whole step of dimension reduction uh, is typically done with like what we use as a subset of highly variable genes. And um, like the idea of using the, just the highly variable genes is that uh, those are actually the ones that are the more informative ones for PCA or MDS. Um, um, the ones that are not really variable, like they don't really matter. Um, and so if we have a ton of data, um, uh, we might just use the highly variable genes to, to improve our computational speed, reduce the amount of memory that we need, et cetera. Um, but like for smaller data sets, you can do it with all of the data. So um, let's open this link in a new tab because uh, it links to a specific section of the speakeasy example. Um, so um, this is some code from the speakeasy example um, um, analysis. Um, where some of the lowly expressed genes are removed. Um, the, this, in this example analysis, um, we're using a function from the recount package called, called uh, get RPKM, uh, which is a way of transforming the counts into um, uh, what's called read per kilobase of map reads, oh, sorry, Read per, reads per kilobase per 1 million map reads. That's the M, 1 million. Um, and so um, 
there are other ways of choosing the threshold more dynamically. So like this is like this is just an example. So uh, here we're removing and we're just keeping the genes that have a, a mean RPKM of 0.2 or greater. Um, um, this will like simplify some of the uh, of the downstream analysis. For a real analysis, this will be a more complicated step, like uh, for choosing which are the lowly expressed genes. Um, but like for, for this example, that's good enough. So once we have that, then we can take the RPKMs uh, um, that we can compute using recount. Um, and then we're gonna log transform them using the log two function, but we're gonna add a small value to it, in this case, one, uh, because uh, if we have a zero, right, we don't want to have a negative infinite value. Um, 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 so definitely. Um, um, I'm uh, opening my um, use this window, um, the use this use, use course um, project. Um, bootcamp intro. Let's make this big. Right, so like log two of zero is going to be negative infinite. Um, yeah. So we don't want uh, negative infinite values. That's why we add a small constant, in this case, one. Um, 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 and so in that way, we're going to extract the gene expression information um, from our object. And there are many ways of computing PC, uh, the principal components. Um, and so here we're going to use the PRCOMP function from base R. Um, um, this function though expects the data in like different dimensions of the one we're giving it. So we're actually going to transpose our data to have the samples as rows and the genes as columns, um, just to make it work with what this function expects. Um, but you'll notice here that there is a set dot seed command, um, and that's because I want to make the results reproducible uh, because this prcom function. Uh, will otherwise uh, not give you like uh, the same results every, sign, every, single, every single time that you run it. So um, I'm setting a seed and I chose today's date as the seed. Um, so I set the seed, we run the peer comp to get those uh, principal component results. And so the object that we get here that we're saving as PCA is kind of complicated. So we actually have a function from the Jaffe lab package called get PCA bars. Um, and so we'll use that, uh, and this function, what it computes is the, what it returns is the percent of variant explained for each of the, uh, of the first PCs that we have. Um, and so uh, Josh, in this case, is then uh, combining that information of the PCA bars and making a little text for the late le legends of the, of the plots later on. So he's, he's combining uh, all that information using page zero. Uh, and so he's gonna say like PC, let's say one, two, et cetera, colon, uh, and then the percent of, of variance that that particular PCA explains, PC component, sorry. So that's how we're doing, uh, how, that's how we're computing the principal components in this case, um, using the log to the RPKM plus one. Um, so, um once we do that um like uh we have now our principal components and we can explore those principal those principal components uh pop pc ones and so the way we can explore them is making scatter plots or box plots um and so we want to compare those principal components against either known covariates that we have from our study uh or the quality metrics generated by speakeasy um, you can also compare the first, you know, the first top PCs. So, for example, PC one versus PC two, or PC three versus PC four, etc. And then uh, visualize the those samples by some grouping variables. Um, 
Uh, so the samples here are dots in that, in that type of scatter plot. And you can color those dots by like, let's say sex or uh, brain region or, um, or diagnosis. And that way you can um, actually identify some potential batch effects. So I'm gonna open this example uh, on a new tab, um, a new window. Um, um, let me make it big. Uh, eh, make it too big. So this is an example of what I'm talking about, uh, uh, where um, here there's only eight samples total. Each of them has a unique color, but they're plotting the first PC that had explains 51% of the variance versus the second PC that explains 22% of the variance. Um, and so in this particular plot, right, like because every single, um, sample has a unique color it's kind of hard to to um to see how the samples are being grouped um you can change things a little bit around and so for example this second plot has um uh the treatment variable uh, uh as a color so blue or red and so here we can see that um, all the blue samples are on the right side so they have a high PC1 value, all the red samples are on the negative side, on the lower side. Um, and so we can see that the first principal component here is related to the outcome variable. That, um, and so that might be good, right? Because that means like the biology, um, uh, the biological factor that we're most interested in is potentially the one that explains the, the highest amount of, of variance. Um, so it has a stronger, strongest effect. That's not always the case for the data that we're working with, right? So like schizophrenia, for example, like that might be like a um, um, uh, schizophrenia disorder case control analysis. The signal there might be really low, right? So it might not actually be the first principal component. Uh, it might be something else. Um, and you could also use shapes, for example. So in this particular ex uh, uh, data that they have, they have four different paired samples and so you can see that the square one is the one that is farthest away from the other shapes on the on the y-axis and so that um that like square sample has some properties that make make it look different from the other other tree and so you might decide to actually exclude that square sample or do something with it um, because um, um it's introducing some difference between between your two groups of variables really, right? Um, so there's maybe like a potential batch effect here with that square one, that square individual, individual might be something you wanna discard from your analysis. So this is uh, uh, the, the um, there's no, there are no specific like hard and fast rules that you can use here, but this is the, this, um, the type of analysis that you wanna be more careful and explore um, more slowly with your data um, uh, because it's gonna really affect like what samples you use for the differential expression analysis. Um, so I'm gonna close this here. Um, 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 so I'm gonna go back to the speakeasy example from that tab that I opened earlier. And so let's look at, there's a bunch of code here. But I wanna just jump to the plots that um, Josh made here. And so he's, the first plot that he has here is PC1 versus PC2. Uh, and the samples, which are the circles, are colored by their case control status. Um, and so you can make another plot like this, PC1 versus PC2, where you color the samples, let's say by sex, or by brain region. Um, and so that might reveal some patterns. Here, like, uh, like um, the green and, and orange dots are always mixed together. So um, um, like, you know, our case control variable is, is not the 
bigness, the biggest um, uh, factor in this data set, uh, but that's kind of expected because bipolar, just like uh, schizophrenia, um, uh, does not have a very strong effect um, on expression, right? Um, um, like if you take, for example, some like mice and you inject some mice with like um, something very strong that, you know, would induce a very strong like biological effect that would alter expression globally. Um, that might not be the case here between bipolar and control. Um, so you, that's one type of plot you can make. Um, but then you can also make like the box plots that I mentioned before. So this, for example, the first PC on the Y axis with uh, one box plot for the, the male uh, subjects and another one for the male female subjects and then another one for the male subjects. Um, um, and so these visually here, we can see that there's no difference really be, uh, between males and females um, in terms of the first PC, PC one. Um, let's look at PC two. That doesn't seem to be uh, really the difference there. Um, or PC3, PC4, and like they, as we go along the PCs, they start to explain less and less percent of the variance. So PC5, for example, explains only 4.05 percent of the variance. Um, it doesn't seem to be really, really a difference there. This is six, uh, seven, eight, and nine, and ten, and like it always seems there doesn't seem to be a big like um, sex effect here. And we can repeat this for other variables. So now Josh is repeating that PC1 now uh, by like the brain regions. And now we actually see like, okay, brain regions there, PC1 does seem to be a bit different between the two brain regions. Um, we could actually do the t-test in this case. Um, 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 but like visually it does seem like there is a, a shift in the PC1 between uh, SACC and amygdala it's not completely like like they're completely separated right there is some overlap um, um, among the samples um, but there is a difference there in PC1 PC2 uh, not as much PC3 a little bit um, uh, PC4 also uh, five um, six is like they're not as much they're not as different anymore right so we can see here that like um, brain region is an important variable that we should um, be adjusting for in our analysis because it's uh, related, it has a, quite a bit of effect in expression. Um, and so here we can choose to use brain region as um, a control variable in, in our statistical model uh, for, that will um, uh, implement uh, further that uh, further, um, um, eh, I, wasn't, I wanted to say like further now, but like we'll, we'll implement that um, model um, later today. Um, so um, exploring PCs is something, or MDS is something that is quite important and you need to make a ton of plots here, right? Um, uh, and, uh, um, you want to explore like all the quality metrics that we have, all the covariates that you have. You want to make box plots, and some of them you don't actually need to make them look really fancy, right? Um, um, at this stage, on, until you find something that you're like, okay, like I need to look at this more slowly. So I want to do an exercise here. Um, so I want you to compute the principal components, just like we did it for the example, um, and then I want you to adapt. Um, uh, the PC1 versus PC2 scatter plot. I want you to make like a, a PC1 versus mitochondrial mapping rate, PC1 versus total assigned gene, and a PC1 versus RNA rate. Um, 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 so when you make those plots, um, and uh, uh, you can just plot PC1 versus mitochondrial mapping rate. You can add colors if you want, you can add shapes you want to those plots. Um, you could all, also like if you wanted to, you can make interactive versions of all these three plots because they're all gonna have the same uh, y-axis PC1, for example. 
Um, so you could all have them like linked to each other if you wanted to make it interact interactive. And so here I have some code to get you started, which is some of that code that we just ran, uh, that we just saw uh, on the on the differential expression um, uh, case, um, which computes the PCs um, and computes the percent of variance explained. So you'll have the data there. Um, let me just um, highlight a very specific thing about how this the plots were made here. And so um, um, let's say we want to have like PC1 versus PC2. So uh, um, 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 or sorry, or like, you know, PC1 or 2 or et cetera. We, we can notice here that that information is extracted from PCA, the object that we made, dollar sign X, and then is the ith column. That will be our ith PC. Uh, so we want PC1 versus the rest. We just want to extract PC dollar sign X, open square bracket, comma, then one close square bracket, right? So that's how we, we can extract that first PC. Um, uh, and, then for example here, like uh, this is plotting that first PC against uh, the sex variable. We don't actually want to plot it against the sex variable. We want to plot it against like, let's say mitochondrial mapping rate. Um, and so you can use this type of formula syntax with the plot function instead of the box plot function. Um, or you can make your ggplot2 um, uh, plot, which in, in that case, you're going to need to make a small data frame. Um, so um, let me stop recording, see if you have any questions and we'll use breakout rooms. All right, so um, um, I wanted, um, you know, like Luis did one of the different types of solutions that you could do. Um, Nick also used a base plotting R. So right now we're, gonna, we're looking at uh, Luis's computer Screen. Um, and so can you, can you explain your solution a little bit? Sure, yeah, I used a uh, Dippler and ggplot to kind of put this together. Um, so the first thing I did was uh, just made a new, a fresh um, phenotype data that I knew I was gonna put this PC1 on. Um, so I extracted the call data, and then I converted it to a data frame. And then I extracted the PC1 out of the PCA object that we created in the chunk above um, and added that as a column to this data frame that I made. And then I use this data frame as the input into ggplot. And then for each plot, we use PC1 as the X. Um, so in the aesthetics argument, I use PC, PC1 as the X. And then our three different um, uh, variables as the Y and then Add a GM point, which creates the scatter plot, and then for fun, I threw in GM smooth um, with a linear fit just to see the trends. Yeah. So we, we can see in that first one the mitochondrial mapping rate is actually uh, associated with PC1, right? We, we computed like the like a correlation coefficient for it. Uh, it would be uh, like a negative uh, correlation, but they're associated. Um, um, and so, Nick, if you don't mind, can we see your uh, base plotting solution? Sure, yeah. Um, okay. I think I do like the ggplot one a little better, but um, yeah, just to show it, um, I basically modified um, the code that was already there. Um, so I just called the plot function, and so we used that this formula syntax to do um, first PC versus the mito rate. Um, this is the um, color of the point. <laughs> yeah, the, the type the, of points. Yeah. Okay, see, I don't even know base plotting that well. Um, but yeah, that's like the so point shape. Um, it's colored by, actually, let me plot it so I can actually, uh, there. Um, so I have it colored by diagnosis. Um, and then another argument for, I think that's point size or something. 
Yeah, point tonight. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean, I did it, did that for Mito rate, but like the um, code would be pretty much similar for the other two. Just modifying this um, the column name. Okay. Um, So uh, we just, ha just saw how to explore gene expression overall. Um, there are more functions out there for doing this. Um, and so um, something else that we have uh, as output from Speakeasy, uh, one of the main outputs is a VCF file, which is a variant common file format. And it has around 740 coding variants uh, that are common. Um, and uh, so the, this means that they frequently change among individuals. Um, um, and so that way we can use this, the information from those 740 positions of the genome to compare samples that we generate data from um, in our RNA-seq uh, studies. Um, or we might have also DNA genotyping data um, external to the RNA-seq data. And that way we can compare them and um, verify sample identity. And so the Speakeasy example um, website includes uh, an example comparison for doing this that was generated by Josh and Luis. Um, and so uh, I'll briefly show parts of this. There's like quite a bit of code and output that goes in here. Um, um, and that's because like, I want you to understand that this is something that we're we're working actively at Lever. Um, and we're trying to resolve sample swaps. And they might happen like in a, a very low frequency, uh, but like actually resolving sam sample swaps is something that can induce you to have like a headache. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, but like the way that this type of analysis looks like is that we can compute this type of, um, um, we can compute correlations among the common variants um, um, and, um, and we can compare our samples against each other and ideally you would just get a diagonal where like um, in this case the diagonal has red values for a correlation of one um, and you wouldn't get any other high correlation values. That's unless you have let's say some siblings or some related individuals in your data set that might um, naturally already share some uh, information. Um, um, uh, but like some potential problems that can happen is like, let's say um, there might have been some sample contamination in the library preparation step. There might have been like completely like a sample swap, like um, let's say someone wanted the brain uh, nine and six and um, you know, for some reason, maybe the six looked like to a nine to someone and they took the brain 999 or something like that, right? Um, and so the way you can notice some of those sample swaps here is that you can see that there's some cells off the diagonal that have a strong, stronger correlation values than expected. So for example, here there's some like pretty um, uh, hot, dark red values. So those, there's potentially a, um, a sample swap in that case. Uh, and some of them, there's some other cases here that might be a bit hard to, harder to determine. And so, um, uh, ideally you want to find something like this where there's no correlation on the diagonal, sorry, outside of the diagonal, only inside the diagonal. Um, um, if you have one, um, one biological sample per individual. Um, if you start to have like, a data set with multiple regions per individual, then you want to start to see them um, grouped together. Um, um, and so, um, because of time, I, I was a bit too ambitious. I thought I would go over more detail about this, but like, I think that's uh, okay for now. It's just to uh, realize that this is a process that we're working on. Um, there's quite a bit of R code that goes into this. So I'll go back to the bootcamp. Um, and I'll start the statistical modeling section. So um, um, there are many bioconductor packages out there um, that um, 
implement different statistical tests for differential expression analysis. There's like, uh, I, don't, I don't actually know how many of them there are, but I would say at least 20 um, or maybe more packages. Um, and so each of them has different statistical um, um, models that they use, uh, then different implementations also. Um, and there's a lot of like different parts of this, of this, uh, of this process where um, you can have different assumptions and that can lead to different models um, and ways of doing things. Um, so uh, some of the three main ones that are most commonly used are Lima, HR, and BEC2. Um, um, so um, they've been around for a while, all of them. They're very well supported, very well documented. Um, and um, uh, I've used all three of them in different situations. Uh, but recently, not in the projects that we've done at Liber, uh, we mostly use Lima. And we do it because um, all of these three different uh, R packages have um, similar levels of performance, uh, like depending on the specific um, simulation data that you use to evaluate them. Um, they're fairly comparable in, in a lot of ways. Um, but um, um, uh, Lima though has an advantage in the sense that it's uh, mostly like a linear regression. And so that means that it's a lot faster than HR or DEC2, um, which use a negative binomial model. Uh, feeding a negative binomial model takes a lot more computing power. Um, and so uh, if we want to, and time really, um, so if we want to analyze action, exon level data or exon exon junction expression data, where we have like thousands more rows than we have in the gene level data, uh, then um, this can become a strong factor. And so for reasons like that, that's why we like to use Lima. Um, um, although like even, even some of our analysis with Lima can take several hours or even uh, sometimes days, day, days to run um, so it's not like it's like in instantaneous for some of the models that we're going to run. Um, and so um, uh, we'll mostly focus on using Lima, and that's the package that is actually used on this bootcamp and differential, sorry, in the differential expression uh, example by Josh. Um, and so because we're going to use uh, Lima, we'll learn the normalization, how to use normalization the Lima way. Um, um, and so um, the first step before you actually do differential expression analysis is you have to make the data comparable um, uh, such that the assumptions of the statistical model like hold true. Um, um, and so this is done through a process called normalization, uh, which in some ways is sometimes just like scaling, like multiplying the, the counts for, by a specific like scaling factor. Um, and so again, I like a lot of these packages for differential expression also include methods for, for normalization. Um, um, and there are different scenarios where like the, uh, where normalization methods can have uh, um, uh, uh, quite a bit of an impact. Um, and so, uh, but like, um, we're gonna use the, um, the method from the HR package uh, uh, called uh, calc norm factors, which is like calculate normalization factors. Um, so this is going to calculate the those specific values that we're going to multiply um, our um, counts by to get them all comparable. And so um, the RNA seq one two three bioconductor workflow, um, which explains how to use Lima and HR. Um, actually has a little section on normalization. So I'm gonna open that as in a new window. Um, that's from the, let's take a look link there. Um, um, so, oh, made it small. All right, so, um, um, uh, so, um, you want to use normalization. So um, Lima and NHR 
uh, they're made um, they're written by people in Australia so they use s instead of z they use a different uh, spelling um, um, so it's not a typo um, and so here they explain that like during like the sample preparation or sequencing process there can be some factors that play a role into um, the data that we obtain from an RNA-seq experiment and they're not really of biological interest right and so um, we want to um, uh, take that into account. Um, um, and so a lot of the uh, models that we use for differential expression are going to assume that all the samples have a similar range and distribution of values. Um, but that like, is not the case with the raw data that we get from an RNA-seq experiment. And so that's why we need to use the normalization to make sure that uh, the distribution of the expression values that we have be similar across the full experiment. Um, um, and so there are many ways of checking this from, from uh, with the raw data. And so here we're gonna use what we call, um, sorry, we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna make some distribution plots of the log CPM. CPM stands for counts per million. Um, and so earlier on in the in our example data set, we were using RPKM, uh, but like CPM is um, um, another um, way of adjusting the 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 number of counts that we have um, per million map reads. Um, 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 so both of those are like they have their differences, but like uh, for for any purposes here, like you can use. RPKM or log CPM uh, just for checking um, uh, uh, if there's a need for normalization. Um, and so HR um, is a, one of the first bioconductor packages for differential expression analysis with RNA-seq data. And they have a paper, which is actually a pretty great paper if you want to read it someday, uh, written by um, Robinson and and Oshlak from 2010. So that's actually 10 years ago. <laughs> this is a, I remember reading this before I started my PG. <laughs> this was a while back. Um, um, and in that paper, they implement this calculate normal factors uh, function. Um, and so it has a, a couple of different options. Um, 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 and so uh, we won't get into those details, but like that's what you can specify with a method argument. Um, but the main idea, I want to skip some of the code here, but the main idea is that you can make here a box plot. And in this case, they have, in this example data set, they have a thing like nine samples, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, nine samples. Um, and they're plotting like the log CPM um, across all those nine samples for, um, for like all the genes. Um, yeah, I think that's all the genes. And so on the left side, we have the unnormalized data. On the right side, we have the normalized data. And you can notice that it's normalized because now the median is like basically the same one across all the box plots here. Uh, the spread is also similar across all of them. Um, um, initially, uh, the unnormalized data, like this um, sample 10, 6, 5, 11, um, had a lot less reads than the other samples. So this one had to get like multiplied by a factor of, of like, um, um, uh, I think it's like 500 uh, or six, um, six, sorry. Um, had to be multiplied by a factor to make it like, um, to increase it, this other one had too many, too much data that was not comparable to the rest, so they had to decrease it all to bring it to the same scale. Um, um, so there's uh, many more ways of doing normalization, um, um, but like, um, um, like this is the base, like the basic way that, you know, works for a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of situations. Um, um, so we'll use that, calc known factors. Uh, with our data. And so calc norm factors works with what is um, 
with some um, other type of objects um, that were created in Biconductor before Summarize Experiment existed. Um, and so one of them is called a DGE list for differential gene expression list object. Um, and so we're gonna create one here uh, uh, where we wanna specify our counts, which are the raw gene counts that we have. And we're gonna specify information about the genes which we're gonna extract from the raw data from the raw, um, brain summarized experiment object that we have. Um, and so we'll create this object over here and uh, Edge R and Lima, the way they function is that um, you can run any of these functions and it will return to you the same type of object but with additional information added to it. So you'll notice here that uh, we're running calc norm factors on the DGE object and we're saving it again into the same object. Um, and so let's, let's do this a little bit ourselves. Um, so uh, let me uh, load data. Um, so let me close this, Have more space. Um, and then load the data. Um, um, that's all our exploration from before. Um, uh, I'll remove the lowly express genes. Um, and then I'll create the DG E object. Mm -hmm. um, so let's ex explore this object a little bit. So it's a list type of object, um, DG list. Um, and so I see here that it has the counts, the samples, and the genes. Um, you are run now count known factors. Um, we should have a new uh, piece of information. Uh, um, um, all right. So there's a new piece of information that gets added, which is the normalization factors. Um, um, and so, uh, um, let me see if I can access that information. So, um, I don't actually remember how to access that part, um, but uh, um, I have to look this up for next time. Um, because I don't remember off the top of my head uh, how to access the, the normalization factors. Uh, it might be defined in the help file. Um, but the idea now is that we, we normalize the, the, um, our gene expression measurements um, and we're at a point where we're, we're ready now to start um, doing um, the differential expression analysis, except that we need to learn a little bit more about um, the statistics. And, um, and statistical modeling. Um, so that's where the design matrix comes into play. So a lot of the methods that we'll be using for differential expression, they depend on the user specifying what's called a, a design matrix. Um, so this design matrix is like actually like the, the core of the statistical model that you wanna run. Um, and so the, the simplest way to think about this is, is in terms of linear regression. Um, although some of the models actually use other distributions behind the scenes. Um, and so R actually has this function that's really powerful for making a design matrix called a model dot matrix. Um, and this model dot matrix function will take as an input a formula syntax. So for example, here is like kill the group plus lane, uh, or you could also use like kill the zero plus group plus lane. 
Um, and uh, these two, you know, similarly looking formulas have different effects on what is the model matrix that you get produced. And so on these RNA seq one to three um, um, uh, workflow, they uh, we can see here like an example design matrix that gets created. So here they're doing model dot matrix with zero plus group plus lane. Um, um, and then they're actually removing the word group from the column name for some of these groups. And so what we end up in the design matrix is a matrix of zeros and ones that uh, we're seeing here. Um, and we get one column per covariate of interest. So actually here we're getting a column that specifies um, the basal group, the LP group, or the ML group. And then another one for the lane, so lane 006 or lane 008. And so if you haven't seen this stuff before, it's a bit hard to understand. Um, um, but one way you can try to interpret this is every row here is one of your samples. So in this particular data set, there were nine samples. And um, the zeros, you can interpret them as false, and one is true. So this first sample over here is. Uh, not a basal sample, it is an LP sample, but it's not from the ML group um, and things like that. Um, 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 so that's one way of interpreting this type of, um, this type of design matrices. Um, and so then uh, like uh, how you can interpret them is also like, um, what is the difference across rows between them, right? So uh, these, uh, the third and the fourth sample, right? They're all most identical, except that the fourth sample has a lane zero, zero, 006 versus the third one that doesn't, right? And so these lane zero, zero, 006, then we can see that this is the difference between um, uh, lane zero, zero, 006 and, uh, um, and the reference group, which I don't actually know what was the reference lane here, um, um, when we're looking at the basal group, for example, keeping the basal group constant, the, um, uh, the group membership constant, really. Um, um, so like all this stuff that I said, I think is like, uh, uh, it's fairly complicated and hard to follow. Um, and so um, one way that I, this is a relatively new uh, bioconductor package, which I think makes uh, all, the, all of this a lot easier to understand is the example model matrix package. Sorry, not example, explore model matrix package. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna look at um, uh, how this is done. Um, and so I'm gonna open their first example in a new window over here. Um, and so uh, why is this package quite useful? So uh, this first example over here um, uh, defines the data uh, uh, um, uh, designs it, defines the example data uh, on this line of code where we have a genotype variable that's either A or B and we have uh, each of them, we have four samples for each genotype and then we have a treatment variable that's either control or treatment. And so this is the equivalent of our cold data, uh, our phenotype data on our rain summarized experiment object. So we have the genotype, which is A or B, and then treatment, which is control or treatment. And we actually have replicates, right? So we have two genotype A control variables, and then two genotype A treatment um, samples, sorry. Um, and then also to be controls and then to be treatments, right? So that's the data we have. Uh, and then they have a function here called visualize design. We can give you the data that you have, the phenotype data, and then the formula for your design um, matrix. Um, and so this uh, information then generates a lot of graphs that can be combined into, into a single graph over here that 
represents that information where we have now genotype on the y-axis, treatment on the x-axis. Treatment has two options, control or treatment. Genotype has two options, A or B. And now we can actually see um, um, uh, on this graph, what are the representations for each of our design matrix columns. So if we're talking about the control treatment group with genotype A, that's actually the intercept column. That will be our reference. If we're talking about control treatments with genotype B, that will be um, our top left corner here. And so we can now say that, okay, genotype B is the difference between um, um, that column, the interpretation of that column is gonna be um, uh, how we can interpret like uh, the difference between uh, genotype A versus B, keeping the treatment um, variable constant. Um, because we can also see, it, see that uh, genotype B show up here on the right side. If you take the top left, top right, sorry, top right, uh, and subtract the top, the bottom right, you'll notice that we're also left with only genotype B. Um, so this information here is like <clears throat> quite useful for understanding the interpretation of the different covariates that we have in our model. Um, 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 so I want you to learn, to learn how to use this. Um, these are relatively new um, bioconductor package. I think it's been around for maybe a year or so. And so the next exercise here that I want you to do is to explore the model matrix uh, from, that we're gonna use in our differential expression analysis. Although I modified it a little bit from what initially Josh did. And so the model matrix that we wanna do here is gonna involve the primary diagnosis variable and the brain region. Um, and so that's how we're gonna create our model matrix for the, for the differential expression analysis. But, you know, like, it's hard to like, look at this um, and then just um, understand what it's actually doing, right? So if I run that code, right? And then print the model matrix, which is a design matrix. Um, well, actually, this is too big. Um, let me print it again. Um, okay, so all these zeros and ones, right? Like, um, I mean, I've looked at this stuff quite a, quite a bit, right? And I can try to understand it already. I can, I can tr uh, kind of interpret what are the names, what is the interpretation of each of these four columns, intercept, primary diagnosis control, primary diagnosis other, uh, brain region, SACC, um, et cetera. Um, 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 but like, uh, but this, uh, they might be harder to understand for other people, right? And so that's where this explore model matrix comes into play. So I actually forgot something here on the code uh, uh, that is uh, on the differential expression um, um, section. Um, and so that little piece of code that I forgot is from section 1.2, the last line of code here for section 1.2. Whereas like, um, I wanna remove, I wanna clean up the primary diagnosis variable. And that's because you'll notice here that I got a primary diagnosis other. Um, I say if I do table RSC gene primary diagnosis, you'll notice that other shows up, but we don't, we don't actually have any samples for that other uh, group. So um, if you run this last line of code, from section 1.2, that will help you clean it up a little bit. Um, so it removes that other, um, and it will make your design matrix a little bit more easier to understand. Uh, um, so if you could run that, like this line of code from section 1.2, uh, the clean up primary diagnosis variable, before you uh, create the model matrix, that will be good. Um, um, so the exercise that I have in mind is, uh, create the model matrix um, uh, and then explore that model matrix. And like you can use that first example that we looked at from the explore, uh, explore model matrix package as a guide on how to do it. Uh, when you actually 
try to run this, though, you'll notice that you might get an error that says that uh, the sample data argument cannot take any values. And so we actually have some columns in our, in our phenotype data that has any values. So you're gonna have to remove those. Or you can just choose some columns to work with. And so you might, for example, choose to work with primary diagnosis, brain region, sex, age, death, et cetera. Uh, and like if you scroll further down, you can actually see the solution. But uh, I would like to recommend you that you try without the solution for now. So let me use the breakout rooms. I'll pause the recording. So, okay. so let me go over the solution I, I have. Um, uh, I saw that both groups were able to, uh, to get a version of it um, up and running. So I'm gonna load a spore, a spore model matrix um, package, and then I'm gonna run the function explore model matrix, which is the one that makes a shiny web application. Uh, and the sample data argument here, that's a more complicated looking part of what I'm doing here. So I'm gonna use the phenotype data that we have from our RSC gene object, right? So from our range summarized experiment object. But like, we wanna specify uh, uh, a specific set of, of covariates that I wanna look at. So I wanna look at primary diagnosis, brain region, sex, age, death, anticlonal mapping rate, total assigned gene, and R RNA rate. Um, that's because some of the columns here have NAs. Um, and I don't know how Louise did, dealt with that um, on her. Um, well, I actually didn't see that part of her solution. Um, and then the design formula here, like I'm just gonna copy paste into it the same formula that I used for the model matrix. So this primary diagnosis plus brain region. Um, so in the end, it's, it's very similar. It looks very similar to how the model matrix was created, where I'm using that same formula, and I'm using the same phenotype information. The only difference is that explore model matrix does not let me have any NAs on it, while uh, model matrix did. Uh, otherwise, it would be like almost the same function call, and so that actually creates a shiny web application. Um, that includes that, uh, that figure that we had earlier. It's so gonna run it uh, with Shiny. Um, um, so it's opening up. Um, let me open it in the browser because that way I can zoom in um, a little bit. Um, um, right. So now that it's fully open, it includes here that plot that we were uh, making with, um, what was it? Uh, visual, I forgot the name. Um, uh, oh, anyway. Um, Let me see if I can find that name again, sorry. Uh, it was, let's look at the first example. Um, oh, visual, visualize design. Yeah, so it makes the same plot that visualize design creates created for us. And so here we can see this, uh, our design matrix, and now we can, um, we can start to see like what is the interpretation of each of the coefficients. So for example, the red one intercept, if we wanna get it just by itself, we can look, focus on the bottom left um, corner and that's where we see it. Okay, that's where we get intercept by itself and that corresponds to brain region amygdala and the primary diagnosis uh, will be bipolar. So that's actually our reference group. If we wanna interpret the green one, primary diagnosis control, Right, so how do we actually get primary diagnosis control by itself? So you can, for example, here, take the top left corner and subtract from it the bottom left corner, or take the top right corner and subtract the bottom right corner, right? And so that's how you can get the interpretation of this primary DX control um, uh, uh, coefficient of our design matrix. And so that tells us the difference between controls and bipolars uh, while keeping the brain region constant. Um, 
we want to get the interpretation of the blue covariant here, brain regions SACC. So that, you know, one way to do it is to take the top right corner, subtract from it the top left corner, or take the bottom right corner and subtract from it the bottom left one. Um, and so that is then the difference between SACC versus amygdala, keeping the primary diagnosis uh, constant. Um, and so this visual representation is a lot um, uh, more helpful for understanding things. You can actually see, see for example, that you know, those zeros and ones, if you actually want to see them. Um, it has more features, like it has this concurrence plot. So you can actually see how many observations do you have in each of those four quadrants. And so we actually made this, you know, we chose this example data uh, and it was chosen specifically to have 10 samples per group per brain region and per diagnosis, right? Um, this won't be the case sometimes <laughs> on a real experiment, right? But we designed it that way. Um, 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 and so like uh, we have equal, the equal number of observations for it, for estimating all of our coefficients. Um, um, and so that's important. Uh, you can have like this fancy correlation plot that like, um, like uh, we would need to spend a bit more time learning about to interpret. Um, and so this shiny app actually lets you like add uh, terms to the design to this design formula. So, so for example, I can add sex. Um, um, and maybe it doesn't crash on me. Yeah. Um, and so now our design matrix is a lot more complicated. We have a lot more like little plots here, right? Um, and so we actually now have, you know, um, two of these uh, two by two tables. One of them is when the primary diagnosis is bipolar. Another one is for it when it's control. Um, and so now we have more coefficients and we can try and find interpretation of them uh, that way. Um, 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 and so you're gonna have to take, you know, the math becomes a little bit more complicated here, the visual math, right? But for example, primary diagnosis control is only shown on the bottom two by two tables, not shown on the top two by two table. So really then it's like the difference between bipolar versus control, or I mean control minus bipolar, uh, keeping the rest of the covariance constant, right? So keeping sex and brain region constant. Um, and you can do you know, that for the rest of the variables. Um, so with that, let me stop recording for today and um,